these people are stupid. These people are stupid. These people are lazy. These people are not interested in being kind to one another. Prince Harry's book, Spare, is finally out following a series of pretty humiliating and revealing leaks. First of all, you know, his frozen penis, his frostbitten penis that he took with him to his brother William's wedding and used his mother's favorite healing cream on while thinking about her applying it to her lips, losing his virginity to a horse girl in the grassy area behind a pub and boasting about killing 25 people. I mean, it has been kind of a mess and predictably the tabloids have been, you know, in an absolute fervor. They've been waiting for this day that a royal actually speaks on their experience within the royal family. Now, I think that this is an interesting topic to discuss as a pop culture historian and also as a journalist journalist because the institution of the monarchy, the crown, is crumbling before our very eyes. It has been in a state of decay for a number of years, but I think that the secession of Meg and Harry from the UK and their sudden reclamation of their narrative and the utilization of their voices currently is really doing a number on the public's perception of the monarchy. And I think that this is a really interesting book to analyze from a pop culture perspective because it's essentially a hit piece on the monarchy. And I, I actually I actually don't think that that was intentional. Harry gets so close to grazing the like foundational problem with the monarchy, which is that it's outdated, it's not modern, it serves no purpose, it's staffed by inherently ignorant, terrible, potentially even racist human beings. But he can't actually go there and say that. And the only reason why he's come to that conclusion is because it affected someone that he loved in his life. And ultimately, I think that this book is a document about how a loveless childhood and a complex grief can be extremely profoundly damaging on any child born in any loveless family and how the monarchy is pointless and embarrassing at this point in history. And also, it is an interesting document about grief and how, you know, the universal experience can transcend send even the most isolated uh, privilege that we can see in this world, which is probably the experience of being a royal. And I will say that Harry's very frank analysis of his own grief and his very honest portrayal of the journey he had to go on to resolve the grief of his mother's death is probably the saving grace of this book. It's what makes him come across as a sympathetic figure. I have a lot of issues with the tone uh, that is used in this book. I mean, we don't often get to hear directly from the royals, and that is with good reason. There is a reason why these people aren't really allowed to get on the mic in public, because they say crazy stuff, and because their worldview is so uniquely blinkered and sheltered. And I feel like Harry is probably the most woke, for lack of a better word, member of the monarchy or ex-member of the monarchy. And even still, there are parts and passages in this book that are genuinely shocking to me, and I cannot believe made it through a publisher, let alone into the public's hands. If anything, this really does truly reveal that royals are just like us. In fact, actually, they're worse than us. They're stupider. They're more ignorant. They are less interested in actually contributing something meaningful to this world. They are a network of backstabbers who are constantly willing to sell one down the river to make themselves look better. It really is a crumbling institution that it also just happens to be a family. The whole like familial part of it really is, I think, second to the uh, desperate clinging on to the relevance of the crown. That seems to be the animating factor that unites the family, for lack of a better term. Everybody is theoretically gathering around to make sure that they can continue to justify their existence. That gets really tricky when someone leaves and starts talking. And there is kind of like an ethical conundrum with this book, because how do you take this information when you know the people that are being written about and quoted directly are essentially under a gag order? Like the royals that are being written about in this book, particularly Prince William, who was painted throughout in an extremely unflattering light, are not really able to respond because of the protocols that they have to follow. And Harry knows this very well, which is why it seems a little bit opportunistic to capitalize on taking uh, another moment yet again in the collective consciousness to take shots at his own family. And ultimately, reading this book is profoundly sad. You come away with the sense that this family is broken. These brothers are never going to resolve their issues. And they are both somewhat permanently scarred and haunted by the traumatic experience of their mother's death. And another thing that is super interesting and compelling about the construction of this book, as a journalist, I think that this is actually a very effective and profound kind of propaganda move on behalf of the of the ex-Sussexes, because this does unilaterally paint Harry 
Harry and Meghan in a very flattering light and paints everybody else in an extremely terrible light. And I think that this is an enduring problem that Harry and Meghan have with the public, which is that they are not sympathetic or likable characters. They, they kind of refuse to take accountability. And it's like, I want to be on their side. I want to agree with them because my personal opinion on the matter is that the monarchy is a completely useless, harmful, damaging structure. I want to side with Harry and Meghan, but there are times when the, the privilege is so unbelievably uh, blinding that I almost don't feel sorry for them at all because I think that there is almost no perspective given. There's not a lot of like humble moments. It's very much like I am the center of the universe. This is what happened to me. And to be fair, this is a memoir. So it's like Harry's story in his own words. He's never really gotten to, apart from the Oprah interview, say exactly how he felt about all of these events and things that have happened to him in his life. So. Of course, he deserves to tell his story in whatever way that he feels appropriate. I just think that it is, you know, as I say a lot on this channel, if you're new here, by the way, my name is Zach, I'm the Swiftologist. I make weekly videos about thoughtful pop culture, but I've talked about this in relation to Taylor Swift, which is that strategic vulnerability is something that all celebrities practice. They will like offer up parts of themselves to you and make you feel as though they're sharing their most inner thoughts in order to reorient the way that you think about them, to engender some sympathy or to make you like them. And I think that... I came away from this not liking Harry any more than when I went into it. I can kind of uh, understand some of the behaviors, the lashings out that he's done, the way that he's felt so compelled to be very public about all of this. But what I can't really get behind is blowing up your family. It's like, I don't care if you blow up the monarchy, that really doesn't matter to me. But there there just seems to be something very like treacherous and disloyal and um, mean about some of the stuff that he said about his brother in particular. Shockingly, Prince Charles comes off pretty well in this book. He just really seems like a bit of an emotionally inept person who doesn't really have the capacity to be a loving father. And I think we all knew that anyway. But William is really portrayed as the stereotypical spoiled little prince. Like he is the heir that stands his feet and gets whatever he wants and has pretty much nothing to do with his younger brother. And that is a thread that Harry sews at the very beginning of the book and continues to, you know, thread throughout. And I think that is probably my main overarching criticism of this book, which is that Harry does not want to take any accountability for anything that went wrong. And he completely refuses to see that Meghan has any sort of culpability whatsoever in the fact that people didn't like her. If anyone has a problem with Meghan at any point in this book, it is for a reason other than maybe them just not liking Meghan or Meghan doing something wrong. It has to be that they are being fed lies by the media. It has to be that they're being racist. And I'm sure there are elements of truth to all of those things. But it also seems to me that Megan isn't perfect. And like, that's totally fine. None of us are. I think that it's this insistence that Megan is some sort of like saintly, otherworldly good person that was just surprise dropped into this mess. That is what seems to rub people the wrong way because it is dishonest. And also the two of them have continued to capitalize and profit off of their position as the royal rebels for multiple years now since they've left the family or the firm as they call it throughout this. But I think that, you know, Sympathy is wearing thin, and I don't know really where they're gonna go with this. Apparently Harry has two more books to come out. I think that this pretty much says it all. But at the end of the day, I am Irish, and I am anti-monarchy, and I am a fan of anything that destroys the monarchy, even a little bit. If you erode it, I think it is a bad thing. I think it should be erased off the face of the earth. I think it's crazy that there are British people who are like willing to pay taxes to support this. I, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to see it kind of blow up in their face, but you know, I'm gonna try and put that aside for the most part while I get into and dissect this book for you. So as a journalist, I have some specific thoughts about the way this was written. Firstly, I was kind of struck by how literary it is at times, and I came to find out that it was written by an extremely prolific ghostwriter who has written a number of other very successful and well-written uh, biographies, memoirs, and I can tell that this is not Harry's voice, right? At times, it really does feel like the ghostwriter is interpreting what Harry has said or filtering it through a literary lens. Um, it can be very heavy handed at times. Certainly it becomes very corny when we get to the Megan parts, like it becomes almost intolerably treacly at parts. I think that there are pretty unilaterally unflattering portraits of a couple of characters in this book that I think do not effectively remind the reader are just one person's interpretation of events. There's three sides to every story, right? There's like your story, their story, and, and the truth is somewhere in between those two. That fact is actually not acknowledged at all throughout the book. I think at many times Harry says, this is my truth and it is the truth. So he will like deny that there exists an objective truth of any matter, but then also insist that his truth is the correct truth. And he gets very triggered when people try to deny his experience. And it's like, you know, your experiences are valid, but 
you are a public figure. People can still cast doubts on your version of events. You want people to listen, so I feel as though it can't be a one-way conversation, which is what it seems that Harry wants after all this time of being harangued and um, obsessed with the media, to be honest. That is another thread that really comes through in this book. He is, to a paralytic extent for himself, honestly, to the detriment of his own mental health, he is totally obsessed with what the tabloids say about him. And actually, I think that is the most draining thing about this book, is reading it. He remembers every headline written about him, the name of every reporter, every editor that did some even small, like slight perceived wrong to him. It's like he's been sitting on them his whole life under this gag order of being a royal and is so happy to kind of unleash and unload. But unfortunately, that is not a very relatable problem. And not many people know what it feels like to have even the most benign details of your life become tabloid father. Some of those things stick and land and I guess continue to be pervasive thoughts that people have about public figures to this day. But a lot of them is just like superfluous nonsense. It's noise. It's not true. It's rubbish. Everybody kind of knows that it's not true. And yet Harry is insistent that it is like a war crime, basically, that people are, are telling lies about him. And that is, you know, part and parcel with being a royal. To be a royal, you must participate with the media. The media is the only way that the royals can actually justify their continued existence. It is propaganda. I mean, that, this is how like imperialism works, right? Like it relies on you having a good positive public image. And the press definitely now has more leverage than the royal family does because back in the day, they could just be like off with your head. So like, you say something bad about me, I'm gonna execute you. It doesn't work like that anymore. And I think that there's been growing concerns about the, the place of the monarchy in the modern world. And the media really has a hand in controlling how people feel about the monarchy, which is why the royals feel very beholden to them and as though they have to engage with this quid pro quo, I give you secret bad information about other people, you write nice things about me, so on and so forth. They feel that this is a necessary process to participate in. And the end goal is to ensure that the crown survives. I don't think that that is a good end goal. Therefore, I don't really care if the press are mean to them. That's just my take on it though. But Harry is totally and completely fixated on the press and that has not discontinued. Even in the interviews that he was doing promoting this book with largely sympathetic interviewers like Anderson Cooper, he has this snide, suspicious, on guardness about him. And I mean, I guess you can't blame him for that given the experience that he and his family have had with the media over the years. But again, this contributes to him coming off not very well and coming off as a very standoffish and unlikable person. Something that was also truly shocking about this book is how brazen the colonial element of it is. The way that Africa is written about and characterized in this book is truly bizarre and frankly kind of like Joseph Conrad Heart of Darkness vibes as though he is the explorer going in to explore a primitive prehistoric world and he kind of paints all of Africa with one fell swoop because he's there all the time so he talks about like Cape Town and Botswana and Lesotho, all of these different like countries within Africa, but they are all described in a similar way. And something very interesting about this is that he's very fixated on describing the landscape and the animals and this like mystical, magical connection that he has to the land. But you never hear a direct spoken quote from any African person in this. It's as though he is the explorer, the person discovering this place and showing it to you. And I think that that is an extremely poor taste in 20. 2023. I don't need to hear a modern day colonial narrative. I don't want it. I don't think anybody wants it. I don't think anybody wants to hear it. Africa seems to be his like chosen beloved place of reprieve, but the way that he characterizes it is so, and he's being like very gushing and overly like uh, complimentary about Africa, but the way that he writes about the, the poverty that he encounters and also the like prehistoric vibe that he kind of imbues to every landscape that he's in, that to me is kind of atrocious and was very difficult to read. And another thing that I found pretty difficult to stomach as well was the military section and portion of this. Again, service in that way lands differently when it's coming from the queen's grandson. When you are kind of indirectly the commander in chief and you are, you know, risking your life alongside other people in a war that was, you know, widely known and understood to be uh, miscalculated, unpopular and uh, criminal even at times, to hear his reminiscences and his thoughts and his justifications for that, I found that also contributed to me coming away from this thinking that Prince Harry was a very dislikable person. It is morbidly fascinating as well to see throughout this book 
the royals stripped of their like mystique and their intrigue and it really this book really destroys once and for all the notion that royals are somehow different from us that they were descended from a lineage close to god right because that's what people used to think of the royals this idea of blue blood of their being like clear aristocratic blood and good breeding and all of those things these people are stupid these people are stupid these people are lazy these people are not interested in being kind to one another and it's like if you can't even treat your own immediate family members with respect how are we supposed to believe that you are a public servant of some description that you are a figure that wants to do good in this world and they talk a lot about the work that they do and the work that they do is they go on these trips and they take pictures with people and they stay in nice hotels and they occasionally will stand next to something terrible going on like a poached dead rhino or a sick child and it's like you don't understand that that's not working right so the book is divided into three parts and they aren't really chapters per se the book is really written in numbered fragments so there are three parts of the book and then uh, it is written kind of like as separate thoughts that all come together under various themes so I actually really like this style of writing a memoir I think it allows for more fictive and literary elements to come through and it's definitely very immersive and I think that it helps when you're dealing with a subject like royalty and the royal family protocol procedures like those things can all feel very like abstract and removed the first part of the book is called out of the night that covers me and the intro quote is the past is never dead it's not even past and this quote kind of sums up this entire section of the book because what we're talking about here is his kind of delayed and complex grief that he had after mourning the loss of his mother which was not really fully supported by his family members and nobody really understood how to deal with it and he had to grieve publicly as a 12 year old boy that was very difficult for him and we in this first beginning kind of part of it we see a lot of the kind of foundational seeds that are being sown he immediately right off the bat kind of compares himself and Megan to Wallace Simpson and King Edward who was the king that abdicated in order to marry an American that is not a particularly flattering comparison to make they were widely reviled by the British public and also Nazi collaborators but you know um being a little bit ahistorical is kind of Harry's thing he definitely likes to like revise the record and uh give his own version and spin on what actually happened so we begin the book at this kind of tense conversation between Prince Harry Prince William and Prince Charles after Prince Philip has died and while they are trying to kind of figure out what the next steps are going to be for post Megxit I think that this was post the Oprah interview as well and we get this kind of like tension coming out here that really sets up the dynamic that he has with his brother for the rest of their relationship and had been existent from when they were children and he says are we meeting for a walk or a duel as he sees William and uh, Charles coming towards him kind of with furrowed brows not looking very happy and he mentions his mother here he thinks about how she would want more than anything peace between the two siblings and that is a really sad thing that you do end up returning back to throughout which is that I don't think a mother would want to see her two children in such a state of discord because it goes beyond them just having bad blood like it really does seem like they hate each other and they are out to hurt each other or avenge themselves for some perceived wrong that the other has done to them over the years simply by being born and yeah so Harry instantly is taking shots at William he says these kind of like nasty and unnecessary comments that don't serve to describe anything that's going on like he calls William's balding alarming he makes it a point to say that it's faster than his he says that his good looks that look like Diana are fading over time like he he gets these little jabs in here and there and that is a really constant thing that goes throughout this like this bitterness then we get straight into Diana's death and Harry was 12 years old when this happened and he remembers very clearly his father telling him what happened and his father just kind of patted him on his knee and was like sorry darling boy um we, your mother couldn't make it and that is as he says kind of the best that his dad could do and it was the most fatherly he's ever been to him and what's interesting throughout this is that Prince Charles is not painted as unloving he's just painted as kind of bumbling and not really knowing how to show his emotions but he is on the whole very supportive of Harry throughout his life and um doesn't make judgments or cast any sort of like negative feedback in his direction when uh, Harry makes a mistake or does something that maybe he wouldn't have done himself he's, he was also very accepting of Meg and very kind to her so to expose your father like this and to say the things that he did end up saying about his father which are even if they are not unkind they are definitely revealing and personal like he mentions that his dad is emotionally stunted because of being bullied as a child and that he carries around this tattered teddy bear that he's had this is like an 80 year old man that still has a teddy bear that's kind of humiliating but also deeply descriptive of a psychic wound that this person has from being in this fucked up family for so long and 
a lot of the things that he shares here, you just get the sense that like they are not his to share. Like these are not your traumas, your personal uh, interpretations of events. You're just telling us stuff that you know other people. Like it is very gossipy and salacious throughout. But I would say the most effective and moving portion of this book is his description of what happened when Diana died. And he remembers feeling uh, both afraid of and confused by the public at this time. And this is a quote that he said about uh, shaking hands with people and feeling the need to console them after his mother died. I remember feeling unspeakable sorrow and being unfailingly polite. I remember consoling several folks who were overcome as if they knew her, but also thinking, you don't know her. Throughout, he also kind of cast some doubt specifically on the version of events that was reported. Like, it seems as though him and William are not entirely happy with the results of the inquest, which is interesting and something else to discuss entirely. They were both forced to walk behind their mother's coffin to the church, particularly a brutal decision for a 12-year-old boy. They both kind of just walked with their heads down and many people on Diana's side of the family said that it was barbaric and cruel and unfair and would leave a lasting scar on the children and the royals insisted that it simply must be done because they wanted to garner as much sympathy as they possibly could from the public and that they did but it did leave both of the boys with a profound psychic wound and I would say that this is where they really started to diverge as siblings as well where their bond and their closeness was really erased because I think they both kind of got shut off privately in their grief and refused to share it together and that set them apart. The prescription of his family to withhold his emotions was especially challenging, I think, for a young boy who lost his mother. And he said that when he finally got to the coffin being put into the ground, only then was he able to cry. And he felt really guilty and ashamed for crying, that he was breaking the protocol of his family and not doing what they expected of him, which was to be stoic and not to express emotion at all. And this is something else that comes up a lot. Not only are they emotionally repressed, they don't touch each other. They don't hug each other. They don't really show any physical signs of affection. So so it's not as though like it, okay yes there are a lot of people that aren't huggers in this world but usually they would make their love for one another known verbally uh harry as a young boy got none of that from any of his family members i don't think any of them did and that really kind of explains why they are trained to view each other as adversaries and uh opponents rather than collaborators and family members to which you are obligated to be kind and express your love to so after this harry describes the the jarring nature of being forced to go back to normal he was really expected to just kind of get on with his life after this extremely elaborate display of public mourning he was sent back to school and just kind of told to get on with it and he tried to but he had no parental figure around and he kind of hints at this throughout the book which is that you know royal people don't get to be parented they are kind of like the property of the state and their raising is really outsourced to other people whether that's a nanny or whether it's the matrons in this boarding school that he was attending where they washed his hair for him yeah, there are certain little details throughout this that make you go, oh, okay, these people are royalty, like eating fish fingers off of silver trays, literally. So he talks about how difficult school was for him. He found it very torturous to sit and be alone and be quiet with his thoughts. And William and Charles were both big academics, very into reading and learning, and that was just not really his thing. And he instead really lent into the physicality of being young. So he roughhoused a lot. He played a lot of sports, anything to kind of keep him busy and stop him from sitting still with his thoughts and really... Uh, kind of processing any of his emotions. He was very stopped up emotionally, and that kind of, I think, was the source of a lot of his problems in his youth, was that he was completely unable to express any emotion, not even just grief, really. I think that that foundational suppression of the grief spilled out into all of his other emotions as he got older. In this section, we also meet his close friend, Henners, who is his childhood friend, I guess, that didn't really care about him being a royal or him being a spare. Harry is very touchy about being a spare. He likes to occasionally assert that it's pointless and it doesn't matter, but he very much views his relationship with his brother through the dynamic of heir and spare, and he brings it up all the time, and he actively seeks out people who don't treat him like a spare. So you can say that you don't care about it, but I think that like these roles are not just, uh, these titles are not just titles. They are also roles that you play within a family, right? And having an heir and a spare is really just kind of like a very exaggerated dynamic of having an older and a younger sibling, but heightened. And I think that because there was like an actual line of succession involved it made the rivalry and the competition between the two brothers something that was really unfortunate and unmanageable. We also get to meet Camilla in this section, and Charles and Camilla are doing their best damage control post Diana's death to force the public to accept them as a couple because they are in love and they do want to be together. And Harry is fairly kind, I guess, about Camilla. He doesn't love the fact that she was involved in their marriage, but he does want his father to be happy. Both him and William really expressed that to the, their father, that they wanted him to be in a happy relationship, to be loved and to enjoy his life. And something that he does say about Camilla, however, is that she is a spin doctor. She 
is obsessed with feeding the tabloids different drips and drabs of information about the boys to distract from whatever negative press is going on about Charles and Camilla. And there was a lot of it at the time, so she needed to do a lot of spinning and a lot of doctoring. And this is a problem that continues throughout the family. And it's not just Camilla that does it, but she is the one who initially kind of sells the boys down the river uh, while they are still teenagers, which I think is kind of unfair. He then goes to Eton, which is an elite boarding school. Again, if he had been a normal student in a normal world, he would not have passed muster to attend this school. His grades and academics were simply not good enough, but he's royal, so he has to go, right? So he goes there and he is really floundering and struggling in school and immediately William says I don't know you when we're at school you're younger than me I don't want to hang out with you and that is a very normal sibling response siblings are super mean to each other when they're teenagers especially when there's like a bit of an age gap between them right like you're my lame little brother I don't want to hang out with you that's very normal Harry makes this point over and over again and he returns to it throughout their adult lives as well uh, he clearly was very damaged by feeling as though his brother did not want to know him and did not want to support him or be his friend at school and that permeates their relationship throughout the rest of their lives. Something else that emerges while Harry is in Eton is that he kind of gets a reputation for being the naughty one because William is the heir, right? So he is a set of duties and responsibilities that are very separate to Harry's life. Harry's essential life is being a literal spare part. Like he's really only there to be backup or insurance in case William dies before he himself can produce an heir. And once William produces an heir, Harry goes even further down in the line of succession, meaning that his whole life, he is really an accessory second tier royal. He's never going to have any sort of like expectations placed upon him. And because of that, the press develops this like narrative around him that he is like a naughty boy, that he's like the, the cheeky one, the one that's not so smart, but like has a lot of like pizzazz and will do like bad behavior, bad boy thing. And that is a label that really upsets him and sticks with him because he doesn't feel as though he was being naughty. He felt that he was suffering and he was lashing out and that there was again, a gap between who he is as a person and how the public was perceiving him through the mediation of the media, right? So we're already getting into him talking at length about how much he hates the media, how much he hates the stories that were being told about him. And it is kind of remarkable, like the, the level of detail with which he recalls all of these random tabloid articles that came out in like 2002 about him shaving his head or about him going to a party and showing his butt in a picture. Like he remembers every single thing that was done and said about him in the press. And I just think that that is not a manageable way to live your life. Like it's, it's no wonder that he is in his public appearances so full of like resentment and bitterness because he's holding on to a lot and he's holding on to a lot of stuff that is ancient history and also is not that significant and doesn't really affect anyone but him and I think a, this is where a little bit of accountability and perspective would would help him and also Megan move on from this situation they can live their lives as human beings outside of the royal family when they stop obsessively trying to correct the record you know things have been said and done and they can't be undone and they can't be unsaid and that includes what they've said and done subsequently since they left so it is a bit of a tricky one and also it just continues throughout this book this obsession with proving that every little detail in every single story was wrong it gets boring to read to be honest and then also when he's in Eton we start to get the very impassioned passages about Africa he talks about how he was almost mauled by a leopard that he thought was a message his mother sent him the leopard didn't maul him and I guess that was the message Diana was sending him but it really is characterized Africa, the continent, as the backdrop for Harry's personal and emotional journey. As I mentioned, it's always about the animals, it's always about the landscape, and he only speaks of Africans to say how poor and unfortunate they are, never, or to say how brave they are in the face of adversity. It's it's kind of patronizing, and he talks a lot about de being dehumanized by the press, and I think that he does a little bit of dehumanization himself in these passages. And here's a direct quote from this section of the book that kind of explains the uh, severity of the no-touch rules in the royal family. No matter how much you love someone, you can never cross that chasm between, say, monarch and child, or spare and heir, physically but also emotionally. The older generation maintained a nearly zero tolerance prohibition on all physical contact. No hugs, no kisses, no pats, a light touching of cheeks on special occasions. I think there's like a pretty good scientific literature about how, you know, as human beings, we need physical touch to feel connected to one another and to feel loved and part of a community. And when you don't have that, that's a very dehumanized way to live. What we also see at this juncture in the book is that Harry and William start becoming very physically violent with each other. They go on these car rides with their dad and they beat the crap out of each other in the back of the car and eventually they have to be separated and put in different cars and Harry says that he remembers looking behind and he could see the future king of England plotting his revenge. And that seems like kind of a benign comment, but Harry is like breadcrumbing us throughout this 
book to believe that William is really out to get him and that his, his main purpose, I suppose, as the heir is to destroy the spare. And I think that that really is a bit myopic of Harry because I think that Harry could not understand the, the different set of responsibilities and pressures that William is facing as the heir. Harry will never understand that because he's the spare. But do you see the dynamic, the difference here? It really is just, again, like a heightened dramatic version of older, younger sibling, but the stakes are a lot higher because it seems that there are like public reputations involved as well. The one time that they're ever really able to come together and feel brotherly towards one another is when they either discuss or refer to Diana. And that is very few and far between because Harry finds it extremely difficult to process her death and can't really talk about it for a number of years afterwards but one thing that they do kind of share for a while is this sad belief that she is still out there somewhere hiding and waiting to reunite with them he really did believe that one day maybe she would come back for them and that was very sad and heartbreaking from the beginning harry is kind of worried about like what he's going to do after school he doesn't do very well and he certainly doesn't do well enough in his exams to go to university and he decides with charles that that is not the right path for him so william goes on to st andrews and is having an amazing time meeting kate doing all that stuff and harry has decided that that's not the path for him and charles is actually extremely supportive of this and he decides uh to help harry come up with an alternative idea and harry says that he worried a lot about finding a purpose he didn't want to be one of those cocktails slurping eye roll causing slots that everybody avoided at family gatherings there had been plenty of those in my family going back centuries so you agree the monarchy is useless pointless and full of lazy people who are no better than anybody else <laughs> okay so his answer to this dilemma of what is my purpose in life was the military and there is absolutely zero critical examination of shall we say the ethical conundrum of being part of the queen's army as the queen's grandson um, at times, he even expresses disapproval of the public's disapproval of these wars, despite the fact that he knows that a bunch of civilians were unnecessarily killed and th this war was started under false pretenses. Like, he seems unwilling to refuse to separate the personal experience of going to war from the structural experience of the military industrial complex. And that's fine, I guess, when you're dealing with a civilian who really is, you know, like a blue collar person or someone who's just decided to lay down their life for their country in their minds. That's what they think that they're doing. That's a noble and admirable thing to do. It's an, an act to do rather than what they actually go and do. But when it comes to, again, a literal member of the royal family, it hits different. It lands differently, just like his uh, beautiful waxing descriptions of Africa also land differently, knowing the context of his past. He seems completely unaware of how being a member of this family and benefiting from it for so many years colors our interactions with him and also does not engender him a lot of sympathy. Before he goes off to the military, his friend Henners uh, dies in a car crash and that kind of brings up a lot of like residual trauma that he has from his mother dying. And this was a another sad event that happened in his young life before he was even like 21, I think. So here's where he kind of uh, starts to introduce the palace's response to the media, right? So it's getting to the point now where he is tired of this naughty boy narrative and he wants to correct the record. And he says over and over that he really wanted to clear his name and he's, he's given the line from everybody involved, the palace courtiers, he calls them, uh, never complain and never explain. And he details every single boring headline, as I mentioned, and Charles is constantly telling him, don't read it, darling boy. That is something that he says over and over and over again. Harry can't, physically cannot stop himself from reading it. And he says that the problem is that everyone else reads it. And he also points out the hypocrisy. He says his father tells him not to read it, but yet every day in various royal households across the country, the butlers are coming in with all, every single British newspaper on a silver tray, and they're all keeping track of what's being said about who and leaking stories here and there. So it is a bit hypocritical for Charles to say, just don't read it, because if he truly didn't care, then he and Camilla wouldn't be like spinning things and leaking stories to people to try and make themselves look better. He then also goes back to Africa, and a reporter is quizzing him in Africa while he's on some, I guess, some like volunteer work helping sick children. Someone questions him about hooking up with a page three model and he is standing on this hill and he looks down and sees i'm going to quote here poverty disease orphans death which rendered everything else as rubbish i suddenly felt ashamed sitting here above all this misery and talking about gossip now he does not keep that clarity or that perspective of the the grand scheme of things throughout this book and he only uses it to shame the writers and the reporters the people that are writing this stuff about him he never uses it to discuss his own place he never says well at the end of the day it's all a little bit silly that i'm getting upset about them making fun of my shaved head in the newspaper because it doesn't really matter that does not come it only comes when he is you know looking down on the journalists and the media who are characterized with a very broad stroke throughout this and i will get to that but 
he does not seem to understand the functional difference between like the press, the journalists, and the tabloids. And there's a huge difference between those two things. Here's another bizarre African moment that I couldn't believe. He is in Africa with his surrogate mother, I suppose another motherly figure in his life, who says to him, I think your body was born in Britain, but your soul was born here in Africa. My God. I mean, I don't, I'm presenting that without comment. I'm not even going to say why that's fucked up. But yeah, then he meets Chelsea, who is our first kind of recurring girlfriend character. And I think she's South African. She lives in Cape Town, but she doesn't really care about the monarchy or who Harry is. And that makes her very appealing to him, makes him very drawn to her because he, you know, is trying to get away from being the spare and getting away from all the press and all the, the drama and the headlines, even though he's totally addicted to it. He explains to her that the press is like having a chronic illness. And she says, quite frankly, back to him that she's not sure that she's interested in having that particular chronic illness in her life. And this is a thread that comes up. He, his doubtful prospects of finding a woman, right? He just doesn't know if he can find someone who can handle it. And he doesn't really seem to be willing to put in the work to prepare someone to handle it. He just wants to kind of throw them to the wolves and see how they fare. And after multiple failed attempts of having girlfriends that just get tortured and humiliated, he still, when he meets Megan, after lots of experience, does not prepare her for any of this, which is why I came away from this being like, damn, you're the problem here. It's not Megan, it's you. You are the person that really is at fault mostly for how a lot of this went down. Then we get into the military and I'm gonna be honest, I have very low tolerance for military content. It's not interesting to me. I don't like reading about planes and war and bombs and shit. It's not, I, I just don't care. He valorizes military service and just totally like idolizes veterans throughout, but he also delivers unknowing critiques of the military as well. When he went to go in for the military, he described how he was the perfect candidate because my trauma over my mother, my trouble concentrating made me more ideal for the army. They were looking for lads like me. What's that you say? Young man, parents divorced, mom dead, unresolved grief or psychological trauma, step this way. Beloved, you are so close. So you agree. You think the military industrial complex takes advantage of young men who are vulnerable or emotionally damaged and goes on to further erode their sense of self while enacting immeasurable harm on the rest of the world. You agree? <laughs> you agree with that? And you're still sitting here talking about how many people you killed so proudly? I mean, it's shocking. It is shocking. So then we get to kind of the first really humiliating incident to which he takes some accountability, but not a lot because he definitely tries to shift the blame for this when he went and wore the Nazi costume to a party. The entire passage is very humiliating to me and also very revealing. The incident is so much worse than I thought it was. The theme of the party, which he describes as cringe, is natives and colonials. It's not horrendous. It's not appalling. It's not inappropriate. It's cringe, just a little embarrassing. And the fact that these stories of these insane blunders and like offensive mistakes that he made because this is not the first time that he recounts being racist or inappropriate or otherwise extremely like prejudiced i suppose is the word to describe it here but the fact that these passages are constantly bookended by this strange fetishistic descriptions of africa just constantly over and over again it's bizarre it's shocking to me that an editor read this and was like you know, maybe we should, maybe there are like colonial undertones to this and we should really maybe just revise some of that stuff, take some of it out. So he's kind of trying to weasel his way out of responsibility for this a little bit. First of all, he says, not one item of native or colonial garb hung in my wardrobe. Babe, what about all those stupid fucking uniforms that you wear for all of these ridiculous ceremonies that you go to with your grandmother? You are the colonists. You are the colonizer. It's like, it's shocking to me that he just has no sense of his relationship and his proximity to colonialism and imperialism. That part to him does not register as why it was especially heinous and especially wrong for him to do things like wear a Nazi costume. This is also our first interaction with Kate, who is also subjected to, I would say, a fair amount of nastiness throughout this book as well. And she is a shadowy presence at the beginning, kind of described as very nice. They seem to get along very well initially, but vilified later on. And she's definitely assigned blame here for the costume because he says, I just wanted to make her laugh. And she said to him, we'll find you something to wear. So he found two options, a pilot costume and a Nazi uniform. And he says that he called them and said, which one should I wear? And they told him to wear him the Nazi uniform. So it's like, he is not fully saying it's their fault, but he refuses to like go down with the ship. He like wants to drag everyone into every single bad thing that ever happened in a very revenge driven way. And the way that he continued to describe it was crazy. I rented it plus a silly mustache and tried it all on. I even snipped the long bits at the end to make it a proper Hitler Mauser. Shocking to me. Then he describes, there were moments over the next few weeks when I thought I might die of shame. Something, I guess, okay that happened from this was that he went to go and meet with a rabbi who gave him a good talking to and he does express some genuine contrition but i mean really 
really. He, it's not like he was 15 or 14 when this happened. He was an adult. He was old enough to know better and ignorant enough to do it anyway, which is appalling. So before he really, I think, gets deployed properly to Afghanistan, he requests to see the secret police files on Diana's death. And he views some very graphic and I would think rather traumatizing images of her in the car as she's sitting there dying while the paparazzi are surrounding her, swarming her car, taking photos of her and not helping her. And this is really a traumatic thing for him to see and they were obstructing emergency services from getting there so of course it raises the question like if they had not been so on top of her would she maybe have survived or would she have had a better chance at surviving uh here's a quote from him on seeing these pictures not one of them the paparazzi were checking on her helping her or comforting her they were just shooting shooting and shooting the last thing she saw on this earth was a flashbulb and for him, seeing these pictures didn't really resolve her death. Um, later on in the book, he goes to the tunnel where she died and drives through it a number of times. And that seems to kind of finally put it to bed that she is gone. She is not coming back. All right, so then we get into part two. Can you believe we're only at part two? And this part is called Bloody But Unbowed. And this is him in the military. And again, I have very little tolerance for reading about a royal family member involved in the war in the Middle East. I don't understand it i don't like it harry does have a particular reverence and almost a glamorization of it and he really paints himself as a hero and it's all very self-involved he goes to the military to give himself a sense of purpose to feel good about what he's doing to feel as though he's making a contribution to the world it's not really about like his country or his fellow people he kind of vaguely talks about democracy here and there but that's only in between like him getting a month off at a time to go back to London and like go clubbing or go on like a tour to the Caribbean. Like he is not living the life of a soldier. And I feel like he has kind of deluded himself into thinking that because he served in the military, he's just like everyone else. But his service in the military was completely hindered by the fact that he couldn't really get into any serious conflict zones because it's a security risk. He is a royal, so he can't really be like on the front lines of stuff. And also, in fact, his presence put other people in harm's way many times. The fact that they knew that he was at certain places, the Taliban, I mean, they would come and attack. And his presence, I would say, was particularly selfish because he was putting other people at risk and in danger and not really able to make any sort of like tangible difference. What he did do was kill 25 people, which he's very proud of. And something that is really shocking to me in this passage is that he compares the journalists of tabloid newspapers to radicalized members of the Taliban. This is a quote. The Paps had always been grotesque people, but as I reached maturity, they were worse. You could see it in their eyes and in their body language. They were more emboldened, more radicalized, just as young men in Iraq had been radicalized. Their mullahs were editors, the same ones who'd vowed to do better after mummy died, and no one seemed to give a shit. Well, babe, there was an entire war going on in which everyday British civilians were losing their lives and a bunch of unarmed civilians in the Middle East were being catastrophically wiped out on a daily basis. So yeah, nobody really gives a shit about someone writing a mean headline about you in the wake of all of these things happening. The contrasting thoughts that are just presented side by side are like truly mind boggling throughout this. And at this point, he is, you know, taking those breaks, as I mentioned, to go back and forth to Africa when he's between tours or whatever. He eventually gets pulled out of one war zone because he was a security risk and blah, 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 blah. Like he's never really truly in it or there for that long because he has to come back and be a royal and live the high life. But around this time, I think he breaks up with Chelsea because he can't really see a future with it. But honestly, he says, like from a snobbish perspective, she's not a very refined person and he couldn't really see his grandmother, the queen, approving of her or the tabloids giving her an easy time. So he kind of knew that it was doomed to fail from the start. And he says, I don't know if she can handle it and I don't know that I want to ask her to handle it. So another problematic blunder that he has with the press is he refers to one of his Pakistani cadets colleagues, friends, or whatever it is, as a derogatory racial slur. And he maintains that he did not think that it was racist at all. He, you know, expresses some sorriness for it, but the anecdote is really included to make us feel sorry for him. It's not included to apologize for calling someone by a racial slur. It's really just to show like, oh, poor me, I didn't know any better. This is what he says about it. Growing up, I'd heard many people use this word and never saw anyone flinch or cringe, or, nor did I suspect them of being racist. I thought it was a word like Aussie, harmless, heated condemnations rolled in that I'd learned nothing. I'd not matured. And it's like, can you fucking blame people for thinking that you didn't learn or mature when you are doing shit like this still after you wore a Nazi costume to a party? I mean, it's pretty shocking. You're in the military now. You can't be just like running your mouth and saying whatever you want all the time. 
And the fact that you never thought about it in the first place is the problem. It's not the excuse. It's not the solution. That is the issue. And he says, I didn't care about strategy. I cared about people not thinking I was a racist. That only after he says that, he says, I cared about not being a racist. And it's like, yeah, but you cared more about people not thinking you were one than not actually being one because these things would never have occurred to you had you not been called out and chastised for them in public. So then he goes to learn how to fly a helicopter and William is also in flight school. So they're living together for a brief period of time and they seem to be getting along fine, I suppose. They're enjoying the fact that Rupert Murdoch's media empire is crumbling around them. There was a widespread investigation into a bunch of the editors, reporters, and staff members that participated in hackings and harassment and various other like intimidation tactics in order to get exclusives. And obviously Harry is extremely happy about that because the number one thorn in his side forever and always are the fucking tabloid reporters. And though Will and Harry were having fun, I think that Harry has that like younger sibling sensitivity that he blows out of proportion all the time and contributes to adding up to this very unflattering portrait of William that I do think is unfair from time to time. So he has a lot of perceived slights when they are doing an interview while they're living together. William offhandedly, like as a joke, says that, oh, Harry snores, Harry can be a little bit slobby. And Harry is like extremely triggered by that because it reinforces this like naughty, lazy complex that also gets at the fact that he's the spare and William's the heir and that like sends him kind of into a tailspin. But again, I think if we're trying to get like a full sense of what happened here, you can maybe see that William was just saying that to like be funny and like to say something in an interview. Whereas Harry, again, perceives it as a major slight and a character assassination. So then he goes to Africa again, uh, where he is asked to shine a light on poaching more by these people that have always been kind to him and host him whenever he's in Botswana. Then he goes to visit some sick children in Lesotho with William. And while they're there, William says kind of like nothing out of the ordinary to him. And as soon as they land back in London, London, Harry finds out that Kate and Will are getting engaged and his brother did not mention anything to him about it on this trip, which is strange. But again, these brothers are almost not brothers. They are literally rivals in a very sad way. This kind of triggers him and it makes him feel insecure about his own progression as a man and as a father. Like he really does want to have that journey, but he feels like he can't ask any woman to sign up to be with him because the advantages do not match the disadvantages. Then he goes to the North Pole and we get some more riveting discovery writing and he <laughs> comes back from the North Pole with frostbite and it's Kate and Will's wedding and he doesn't have time to go and get it checked out but his penis that he refers to often as his todger is frostbitten. Then there is a disturbing passage where he talks about how his mother used to use the Elizabeth Arden eight hour magic cream to heal her lips and he talks about her putting it on her lips and then in literally in the next sentence talks about him putting it on his penis. Like it's just such an unfortunate setup and I question the ghost, I, sometimes I wonder if the ghostwriter was like trolling him throughout the book because there are truly like hard to believe cringe passages throughout. So he mentions a couple of times throughout this account that William also suffers from being stuck in a box and he only says this a couple of times, but you have to remember that whatever pressures Harry was feeling and facing from the firm and the palace and everybody is doubled, if not tripled on William because he is the heir, unfortunately for him and for everyone around him clearly, because apparently he wasn't a very nice heir. But yeah, he does kind of mention that, you know, for William's wedding day, he wanted to wear a certain uniform and granny said no. And it's like when granny says no, it's not really granny saying no. He alternately refers, Harry does in the book to granny as commander in chief and also granny. That is a really confusing relationship to navigate and knowing when to engage which or the other is kind of hard to tell. And it seems as though the queen was pretty much always in commander in chief mode. Even if she was trying to be like nice, she would go out of her way to avoid having to do so and would prefer instead to keep things formal. So then he goes on on his first official royal tour by himself to the Caribbean uh, at the behest of his grandmother. And he is very self-congratulatory about that. He then meets Cressida, who is like the second long-term girlfriend that he exists in the Harry universe before Meghan, the kind of last one before he meets the love of his life. And there is another tabloid scandal. He goes to Vegas, someone takes a picture of his butt. He devotes like 10 pages to talking about this. It's extremely boring. Again, I don't care about the tabloid headlines. So then he is deployed again and he gets a little bit more into the psychology behind killing people and serving in this war and I'm just going to quote from him here because, you know, his words say it better than mine. I asked myself if I was callous, perhaps desensitized. I asked myself if my non-reaction to killing people was connected to a long-standing ambivalence towards death. These were bad people doing bad things to our guys. The guy I just removed from the battlefield, removed, not killed, removed, had, hadn't already killed British soldiers. He soon would. Taking him meant saving British lives and British families. After this, he, I think, has to leave Afghanistan again for some unknown reason and goes to America and meets with a bunch of disabled veterans who, like, really get a lot of 
felt joy out of playing sport. And this is where he comes up with the idea of the Invictus Games, which is the Paralympics for veterans that he has organized and has probably been his most successful royal project. And the family response to this is very revealing of the dynamic. He comes back and the entire family is very annoyed at the fact that he has put together this whole concept and not run it by them first. According to Harry, William is allegedly sorely irritated and complaining about how all the funds in the Royal Foundation would be used up. And then Harry goes, but I was told it was only about half a million pounds that would be needed. And then I realized, oh my God, sibling rivalry. And it's like, oh my God, we're brushing past the Royal Fund. Okay, the Royal Fund, where does all that money come from? It is from your father. Where does your father get that money from? It is from like looting and stealing from people over the years. That's why he has all these investments coming in because it's all off of things that were stolen on the back of other people. And if it's not from that, it's from the British taxpayers. It is money that good, hardworking people pay for you to do this shit and argue over who gets to have veterans. And then Harry's saying it was only half a million pounds like no fucking concept of what half a million pounds is what it means to make that money what it means to earn that money what that money could do for other people it's crazy to me and then harry goes have we not gotten past this error versus spare thing why was willie being so competitive and it's like you say that have we not gotten past it but you are constantly reminding yourself of it bringing it up talking about how you are the spare and how william was always acting like an heir it takes two to move on from a scenario and it seems that both were being sticks in the mud on that particular topic then in in, I think around 2012, 2013, he says that the mood in the family is kind of shifting. And this is when his personal experience with anxiety and panic attacks starts to come up. But he says that there is a court circular, which is this event, I guess, where they all, everybody, all the royal members of the family gather and they tally how many royal engagements they did. And this is, I suppose, to prove who is the most hardworking, who can go to like as many openings and like ribbon cuttings and all this shit. Like none of this is work, by the way. It's really just appearances that you make. Like you are literally an influencer, basically showing up and taking a picture, promoting a cause as though it's a product. Like that is exactly what you do. So they have this thing called the court circular where they all compare notes and see who is the best, I guess. And Harry said that this became more and more important as the mood of the royal family became a little bit more anxious. And I'm gonna quote from him directly again. Maybe the stress around all this stuff stemmed from the overarching stress about the monarchy itself. The family was feeling the tremors of global change, hearing the cries of critics who said the monarchy was outdated and costly. The family tolerated, even leaned into the nonsense of the court circular for, for the same reason it accepted the ravages of the press, fear, fear of the public, fear of the future, fear of the day the nation would say, okay, shut it down. God willing, that day will come soon because this family is a fucking mess and they do not deserve to be using money that is, you know, taken from the hardworking pockets of the British public to do this shit and behave this way. The Harry moves into Nottingham College, which is where Kate and Will lived before they did their big renovation, wherever else in whatever fucking palace they live in. And that is something else that Harry does a lot. He like complains about his living quarters. He's like, mm, when I lived in Kensington Palace, they gave me a basement apartment that had no light. And it's like, you're living in a palace, babe. Like, how can you possibly complain about this? Kim, there's people that are dying. So after the Invictus Games is born, he announces that he's leaving the army to be a full-time royal. And this is only when like the family drama starts to escalate. So we get more stories and examples of them infighting within the family. Charles and Camilla are constantly leaking stories about Kate and Will that are kind of negative to give them less good press so that they can look more favorable and it's all like trivial to be honest like the headlines that come out are things like William's not working hard enough like it's not like William murdered 10 people it's not like gross accusations it's not slander it's just rumors spread in documents tabloids that everybody knows to be not true so they really have an inflated sense of importance about this but of course they do because they're the royal family having an inflated sense of importance is kind of their whole thing Harry also talks about how cool it is that he does his own laundry, how humble he is. He cooks, he goes to the supermarket, he doesn't care about clothes. Um, uh, but meanwhile, you know, while he's bragging about how normal he is, he's also experiencing a bout of agoraphobia that is really getting kind of intense, which is hard when your entire job, I suppose, is to go out in public and meet people, shake hands, give speeches. Uh, naturally, the, the vision of a camera lens is quite traumatic for him. So he starts to not be able to deal with his day-to-day -day existence and, his brother tells him to go to therapy, which he says at the time doesn't work, though he does revisit therapy after he sees Megan. Um, he takes some psychedelics to work through his trauma and he found that to be very helpful. I wish that he'd made his point on that being an emerging science with emerging literature and not something that's immediately accessible to everyone a little bit more clear, but you know, it is his, again, subjective account of what happened. So that is part of his journey and his story. So him and William have more insane squabbles and spats over their different charity works. William says that Africa, the continent of Africa is his thing, and it's within his power to veto it from happy. I let you have the vets, give me my rhinos and my elephants. That is a quote. I mean, 
It's disgusting. It's like truly, this is appalling behavior. It is crazy to me. This now I understand why they muzzle the royals and make sure that they're really kept away from addressing the public directly because the shit that they say, the thought process that they have, honestly, they should be subjected to more abuse from the press because it, whatever they hear, the criticisms that they get is never sunken into their brains. It goes in one ear and out the other. They're like, who said that? It's fake. That's not true. I want to correct that. I want them to stop saying it. Here's some information about someone else. So you stop talking about me. There's never any sort of accountability for anyone in any circumstance. Then there are some really painful, charmless passages about him doing psychedelics at Courtney Cox's house. Such relatable content. And finally, we get into the last part of the book, Captain of My Soul. This is where he meets Megan and everything starts to like formally go wrong. And there is honestly so much nauseating content about them from when they started dating. Like it's just, it's so corny. It's so cheesy. It's really irritating. There's so much information that you don't need to know. And the two of them just come across as very self-absorbed and out of touch. <gasps> Why do we care about the Royals? I'm sitting here talking about them for an hour. Why am I doing it? They are not important. And something that is kind of funny is that Harry is like constantly insisting that Megan was this huge huge star before they met each other, right? That Suits was this huge show that everybody was obsessed with and everybody was constantly hounding her, asking her for her autograph. And it's like, nobody believes that. Nobody believes that Megan was an A-list celebrity. Nobody fucking knew who she was. There aren't even like any Suits stands out there. It's not that kind of a show. It's not like Riverdale where like all of the cast become these celebrities. It's like the, again, the inflated sense of self, the detachment from reality is very off-putting. He states from the beginning that Meghan was always very clueless about the royal family and the protocol, which I suppose is fine when they're dating, but as the relationship starts to progress and get more serious, I am completely baffled by the fact that Harry did not prepare Meghan for any of what was coming to her. And I don't even mean like prepare her to be chased by the paparazzi and the media. I mean, he didn't give her a royal protocol briefing on like how to greet his grandmother, how to greet his father, how to greet his brother. Like this is technically a commoner meeting all of these royal people that have these very complicated social graces and norms that you must follow in order for them to not hate you and to not think that you're being disrespectful to them. And like, I think that they're stupid and I don't think you should follow them but if you want your partner to get off on the right foot with your family and have them embrace your partner you should really take all the steps and efforts to make sure that your partner doesn't offend them i mean just translate that to any sort of cultural norm take the like social protocol out of it like intercultural relationships you know you need to prep your partner to give them the best chance at succeeding with your family. So I think that Megan really did get off on the wrong foot with a lot of the family members because she just didn't know any better. And that's his bad. She, she is not supposed to know this stuff. I definitely think that she def she played more clueless than she actually was like the whole, I don't really know anything about Diana cannot be true. I don't know who Prince Harry is. Cannot be true. Like you definitely had an awareness of this again. Let's not revise the record. Let's not deny reality, but I think Harry has a lot to answer for here in terms of how he just kind of expected everything to go smoothly. And because he loved her, he thought his family and the British public would embrace her. Again, very myopic, very narcissistic, very expecting everybody to conform to what you want all the time, not how it works. I mean, an example of this is like, she literally met the queen by accident. They were going to someone's house for tea and the queen just like so happened to be there. And his aunt came out for like one second and showed Meghan how to do a curtsy. And then they like gave her all of these rules. Say ma'am rhymes with ham, not mom rhymes with jam. It's crazy to me that it was kind of on the fly preparing her for all of these things. No wonder the girl was overwhelmed and made like a lot of faux pas in public because Nobody thought to sit her down and give her an education. And before she was engaged to Harry, before she was like an official part of the family, the only person that is responsible for doing that is Harry and he did it. Then he writes about William being a little bit like taken off guard and thrown off by Meg hugging him. And it's like, well, duh, Harry, first of all, you don't hug your brother. You said that multiple times throughout this book that you don't hug him. And that's not something that you do in your family. Also, it's like 1 million breaches of protocol to hug the heir to the throne, you know? It is unbelievable that he somehow manages to paint William in an unflattering light for being surprised and thrown off by that display of affection and instead cast Megan as this like benevolent person that just wants to hug everyone. It's like, come on, you didn't do your due diligence. You didn't give her the best chance to succeed and now you want to punish everyone else for it and not take any accountability. It's dislikable. He then goes on to say that he thought that Meghan was the exception to the rule in terms of people being able to handle the royal family, but he doesn't really expand on why he felt Meghan could handle it. Clearly she couldn't. I don't think anybody could. 
Um, but he also didn't try and like again anticipate any of the sort of issues that came that would come up with her joining the family, her being an American, her being a mixed race woman. None of those things were preemptively considered by him. It's not her job to do it because this is not her realm of expertise. This is not her culture. Like you have to prepare your partner, set them up for success. And he just uh, obsessively didn't, he just repeatedly failed at doing that. All of Meghan's interactions with the queen seem to have gone fairly well. And when she meets William, it is different because they have that like mishap of the hug. And when, when she meets Prince Charles, it goes really well. He really likes her and continues to be kind to her throughout their entire relationship. So in November, 2016, the relationship becomes known to the public and a torrent of horrific racist abuse just comes spewing out from the British public, from the press, from politicians, from celebrity. Headlines saying straight out of Compton, saying that Harry was marrying into gangster royalty, saying that he would dilute the blue bloodline with some exotic DNA, like straight up racist shit that I don't think American tabloids would get away with printing any of that. It's very bizarre that this is allowed to be printed in the UK, but when the tippy top of the country is racist, imperialist, and corrupt, what the fuck do you expect to happen? What do you expect the trickle down effect to be? But again, it is funny to me that Harry was so surprised by this response. He did not consider or prepare or anticipate any of these problems. Why? Because thinking about topics of like privilege, class, race, money are topics that don't come naturally to the royals who, as I mentioned, are at the tippy top of the institutions that uphold all of these negative and damaging means. So Megan is subjected to the kind of abuse and torment that any wife or girlfriend is subjected to, but there is that added element of the, the racial part that comes along with it. And it seems as though the palace and the firm had absolutely no idea how to handle that. And he, Harry, to his credit, does reach out asking for help. What do we do? Can you shut this down? Can you condemn this? Can you say that? Um, and he makes a good point that there's no historical precedent for dealing with a woman of color or a person of color coming into the royal family because it had never happened before. And this is a, an institution and a structure that has many resources and could absolutely call upon a crisis PR firm to come in and consult with them on this, but they didn't do any of those things. They really didn't, they didn't lift a finger to protect Meghan from any of this. And that really, to me, is kind of unforgivable. And I can, at that point, see why the breakdown with the family relationship follows. Because from there on, William and Charles and everybody else in the family seems to want to deny that there is a special part of this problem. There is a part of this problem that no one else in the family has to experience. Because of their own ignorance, their own blindness about class and race and money and privilege and all this stuff, they refuse to consider that perhaps Megan has had it harder than other people. So his violent feelings towards the paparazzi and the media writ large are bubbling, obviously, at this point. And something that I don't like is that he constantly makes absolutely no distinction between tabloid journalists and actual journalists when he's speaking about the media because he paints them all with a broad stroke. Like, I think at some point, Charles says that, like, journalists are the lowest form of a human scum, that kind of thing. And it's like, hmm... Well, of course, you are the people in power. The people in power do not like the press or the journalists because the fundamental role of the journalists, not tabloid reporters who are a completely different thing, they are, you know, essentially uh, professional stalkers. Journalists are there to hold people in power accountable and to speak truth to power. That's like the, the missive of journalism. And of course, if you are the you know head honcho of a crumbling institution that wants to profit off of subjugating other people and convincing other people that you are more special than them and that you are closer to God, more divine, whatever the fuck it is, that you have some right to take their money and use it to fund your private planes and all of your silly maintenance of your castles, of course, you have a vested interest in disparaging the press. And I think that the royal family like deserves and should expect a reasonable level of scrutiny. For example, later on in this book, when the Duke and Duchess surrender their royal titles uh, and scale back their duties, he is very mad at various media publications and journalists for suggesting that their security bill should not be footed any longer by the British taxpayer. If you're renouncing your royal duties and doing the one thing that is ex expected of you as a royal couple, why the fuck should the British taxpayer pay for your security? Do it yourself. It's not like you have nothing. Like It's not like you're destitute on the streets. Go out and work. Have you tried that? Have you considered working? Another part that is kind of not really addressed at all in this book is that Megan is not a very likable person. I don't particularly find her to be to be likable. I think that she's a little um, stiff and cold and rehearsed. 
And I think obviously there is a racial element and an anti-American element that comes from the British public in terms of their response to her. But also I think that Meghan maybe just isn't the most authentic, personable celebrity in the world. That's totally fine. It's kind of a rare quality to be a Diana, to be a star, to have that instant connection with people. There's a reason why Diana was the exception and not the rule. And yet Harry is like insistently comparing Meghan to Diana over and over and over and over again throughout this book. And I think that rubs people the wrong way. So after he, you know, expresses his intent to marry Meghan to his father, his father basically says, listen, I got to cut you off. I can't afford to pay for you both. And he is enraged by this. I'm just going to quote directly what he said. Pa didn't financially support Willie, me, and our families out of any largesse. That was his job. That was the whole deal. We agreed to serve the monarch, go wherever we were sent, do whatever we were told, surrender our autonomy, keep our hands and feet inside the gilded cage at all times. Boo hoo. And in exchange, the keepers of the cage agreed to feed and clothe us. Suddenly, this became clear to me that it wasn't about money. Pa might have dreaded the rising cost of maintaining us, but what he really couldn't stomach was someone new dominating the monarchy, grabbing the limelight, something shiny, and coming in and overshadowing him and Camilla. He lived through that before and he had no interest in living through it again. I mean, I think that Will and Kate probably overshadowed Camilla and Prince Charles a little bit more than Harry and Meghan. And the response from the public to Harry and Meghan was kind of uniformly negative from the start. Like there wasn't really an element of threat, I think. Maybe he didn't want them to have attention, but I think also like Prince Charles has always talked a lot about like slimming down the monarchy and Queen Elizabeth herself was somewhat more careful about like spending money, British taxpayer money on various like luxuries that the royals wanted. So again, this is Harry's interpretation of events. He assigns a lot of ulterior motive to people without actually knowing what they think about it because most of their interactions with each other are like things that go unsaid. They don't, they're not honest. They're not candid with one another. So then we start to get into more Kate and Will slander. He constantly contrasts Kate's uptightness with Megan's free spiritedness. So they have a dinner party and Megan is barefooted and in ripped jeans and Kate is done up to the nines. And he kind of is laying up this tension between them as Kate having to stick up her ass and Megan being, you know, like innocent, totally like wanting everything to be copacetic all the time. So the press obviously muddles up this dynamic too. They are being pitted against each other and they are sharing an office, but what's happening in their press office is that all of their staff are infighting and like taking secret sides and it ends up becoming a very stressful toxic work environment to which everyone contributes including all four of the fab four as they are called. He also brings up a few like trivial uh, events where Megan seemed to have pissed Kate off in some way where she asked Kate to borrow her lip gloss. Kate apparently seemed very put out by that. She didn't say anything about it but again Harry infers that that was like the first stone that was thrown. Kate was so offended by that. So something that kind of seemed to come back and bite him in the ass a little bit was he refused to play the quid pro quo game with the Royal Rhoda, who are the like team of journalists and reporters from the media that are given extra special coverage of the Royals. They get little tidbits, they get sneak peeks, they get special access. And the idea is that if you give them exclusives, they will give you good press. And the monarchy needs press in order to exist. They have to justify their existence. The only way they can do that is by communicating to the British public through the press. They have no actual like government powers really they have no other way to exert their force or to show their worth so it's like at this point harry you're still a working member of the royals you have to play the game or expect them to turn on you the game is larger than you the game is being played by players at a different level and if you refuse to participate something bad is going to happen to you and so what harry decided to do was deny the royal rota access to the wedding directly they were not allowed inside the chapel that was kind of a break of protocol or the done thing and they paid the price for that the wedding goes pretty well, apart from Kate and Meg having like a bit of a dust up, I suppose, about Prince Charlotte's dress that she wore as a flower girl. Kate was very short with Meghan and Meghan was kind of going through some stuff with her father at the time that was really stressful and playing out in the tabloids. And she made Meghan cry and, you know, Kate apologized and it was all fine. But after the wedding, slowly these stories are starting to come out that are twisting things. So the story comes out and it's that Meghan made Kate cry when apparently everybody knows that not to be true. And also Meg is getting some pretty bad coverage from a visit that she did with the queen, which by all accounts went pretty well. The queen was very pleased with her, but she broke protocol and got into the car before the queen and everybody like pounced on that. Apparently the queen told Megan to do it, but like, whatever. Do you see the minutia that like is delved into into this book? Like it's very, every single thing is refuted. And you know, I guess this is only chance to correct the record. So that is exactly what he's doing. And so even though that was not true, this story about Megan and the queen and her breaking protocol and being disrespectful, he wants the palace to correct that narrative and the palace says no they refuse to issue a statement saying that it's not true and this seems to be this is where the beginning of the end starts where the palace is not 
striking down things that are patently false and everybody knows to be false because they don't want to. And that kind of goes with their motto of never complain, never explain. He argues that this is unfair because other members of the royal family frequently are given that grace, are given the opportunity to shut things down, but him and Meghan are told no all the time. They're not allowed to correct the record and the bad press just keeps mounting. So the tension between the Fab Four, Kate, Meg, Will, and Harry, all kind of comes to a head when they have this confrontation where they're shouting at each other and Kate says that Meg offended her by saying she had baby brain. She said, you're not close enough to talk to me about your hormones like that. Harry blames this confrontation on people in their office kind of stirring things up and leaking stories and doing things here and there, like basically a bad game of whispers going around and certain things getting back and getting mistranslated. And Harry, again, does not want to take any culpability for that. He blames it all on William for hiring people from the government who engage in cronyism and, you know, abdicates any sort of like potential like because Megan had a, apparently had a reputation for not being very nice to staffers that is not entertained as a possibility at all it is all William's fault for hiring people that wanted to see them fail don't worry you're not imagining things I did in fact change my shirt into a darker shade of blue because I had to pick up recording the last part of this video the next day so so the conversation between the fab four where they're kind of screaming and shouting at each other ends in a kind of I would say a ceasefire but it picks up again later on when there is further squabbles and disputes about whether or not Megan has been bullying members of the staff where William comes over to Harry's house in a complete rage and throws him on the floor breaking the dog's bowl and otherwise kind of putting the final nail in the coffin of their extremely dysfunctional relationship that was kind of only at a ceasefire and not really at any sort of a resolution. Also around this time, I mentioned earlier in the video that Megan was having some issues with her father. He ends up sending her private correspondence to the Daily Mail who publishes it. That is illegal. Uh, Harry is obviously incensed about this and he believes that there's a super narrative being built around Megan being a difficult duchess that is completely being supported by the palace. And to kind of test and see if this assertion is true, he reaches out to them and asks if they will assist him in suing the mail for doing this. This was not an unprecedented ask of him. His father had also sued the mail and William had sued the mail over topless photos of Kate Middleton, but they refused to intervene and said that they would not help them. Harry and Meghan were pretty heartbroken by this and hired their own lawyer to launch a lawsuit against them instead because they knew that what had been done was in fact illegal. And Harry's kind of supposition on all of this is that the mail only felt emboldened to publish a claim like that in the first place because they knew that Meghan and Harry would not have the support of the royal family behind them to sue them should anything go wrong. That again, is something that he like adds in as an inference rather than something that he knows to be a fact for sure. There is of course a muddling of that throughout this entire book, but it is an interesting and revealing moment nonetheless, and definitely the straw that broke the camel's back. So when they move to Canada to kind of try and get a break from the relentless paparazzi attention, they drop a plan to leave the royal family without really leaving it. The idea behind that is that Harry wants to live in the UK where he's not tormented by the press and the photographers. And I understand that, but you can't have it both ways, right? Like part of being a royal and surviving as a royal and making sure that the crown stays alive is being visible and being with your public and you taking the beatings that come from the press. That is part of the job. It really is the job description. So you can't really be a working member of the royal family without participating in that. And hiding away is kind of not fulfilling one of your central duties, probably the most important duty that you have. And that was, a uh, predictably not met with a good reception by the palace or by the people in the firm. So Prince Charles received a private letter from Harry with a very small detail saying that they would perhaps be willing to discuss giving up their titles. Harry says he didn't tell anyone else that. So when this detail breaks in the press and people find out that Meg and Harry are trying to leave before they're ready to share their announcement, he knows that it pretty much came from his father's office because he had only mentioned that detail to his father. They have what Harry refers to a couple of times as the Sandringham Summit, where they all kind of get together and try and see if there's a way forward for the monarchy, including Harry and Meg, and they just can't come to an agreement. And it ends up being Harry feels that his hands are tied behind his back and he just has to leave cold turkey, go away and leave. And that is pretty much exactly what happened. Now, only at this point in the book does Harry kind of start to get at some sort of questioning of the purpose of the royal family and also the goodness of their intentions. So I'm gonna quote him here. He says, everything I'd been taught, everything I'd grown up believing about the family, about the monarchy and its essential fairness, its job of uniting rather than dividing was being undermined and called into question. Was it all fake? Was it all just a show? Because if we couldn't stand up for one another or rally around our first biracial family member, then what were we? Was that a real family? Is this a true constitutional monarchy? I mean, 
the, the fact that you still, you know, up until this juncture thought that a monarchy had something to do with essential fairness, like I really just don't understand his conception of what the monarchy was before or after. And he's come out in interviews subsequently and said multiple times that he's not trying to dismantle the monarchy. He's not trying to destroy it. He's trying to release his father and his brother by bringing the truth to light. He's almost getting at something here again. He's talking around it, that a monarchy is not essentially fair and a monarchy's job is not to deny it. It is in fact to divide and conquer, but he refuses to go there, I guess, because he still has some sort of like loyalty to his family and also to the crown, weirdly. Like, I think that he and Meghan wanted to be like Kate and Will. They wanted to be loved. They wanted to be working royals. They wanted to be respected. They wanted their son to be a prince. They wanted all of this, the trappings of the royal family, but they wanted to do it on their own terms. And I think that that is a bit unrealistic and very self-centered or like an, Amer an American approach to it, like do it my own way, DIY monarchy, pick and choose the things that I want. That's not how the crown works, babes. Everyone in it is pretty fucking miserable, as he soon came Came to find out. Then he gets cut off by his father, so no money whatsoever. Harry has a very impassioned kind of meltdown about how he'd been infantilized all his life and now suddenly he was being criticized for um, uh, being a child and not knowing how to do normal people things. And it's like, okay, well, I can feel bad for you for maybe like two seconds and then you just have to get over it and get on with it because everybody else in this world has had to come of age much more brutally than you have. So sorry that it only had to happen to you when you were like 38 years old, but you know, put on your big boy shoes and let's get to work. And then kind of regarding the aftermath of leaving the Oprah interview, Harry's words on it are, we felt we had no choice. What's the difference between what my family does? We let them see the words coming out of our mouths instead of hiding behind them. That I can kind of understand and support almost like the idea that they are constantly the royal family I mean taking these shots and putting in these like stupid fake news like stories through palace sources into the Daily Mail I think it is better to come out and just say it what it is that you think rather than engaging in this very silly subterfuge but again I think the dogmaticness of Harry and Meghan's narrative and how they're unwilling to like accept any sort of like critical responsibility in their narrative and they're just not going to be questioned on it by the only other people that have the authority to set the record straight the royals because they are under a gag order essentially it would be really interesting to see them break protocol and give their version of events too because then we could get closer to finding that middle ground of the truth between the two biased interpretations so the book ends with a very kind of sad confrontation between harry and william where william is really trying to impart to his brother like i want you to be happy and harry's like i don't believe you and will says i swear on mommy's life and harry says that that was always their kind of like secret password that meant whatever they were fighting about they would stop fighting because you know they would invoke their precious mother's beloved memory to get them to realize and remember that they loved each other. But Harry says quite plainly that that just wasn't working on him this time and he didn't believe him, which is quite sad. And like there is a true erosion of a relationship between these two brothers. And I think that their mother would be heartbroken to see it. And it's hard to imagine a path forward for them, especially after the way that I think Harry has deliberately character assassinated his brother in this, in this book. Uh, for sure, nobody really was spared from his exacting observations, but I do think that there was an extra special resentment that only a younger brother can have that was uh, foisted upon William in this book. And that kind of gets at my central like argument about the book, which is that it's interesting, it's kind of gossipy, but you know what? At the end of the day, I don't give a shit about these royals. I want the crown to burn. I want Buckingham Palace in flames. Like I do not really care about the survival of the crown. And I don't think that the royal structure has any sort of relevance or um, interest to us in our modern world. And so, yeah, I mean, say more, Harry make more books write more stuff but i will say it is pretty it is pretty intolerable i think we're all ready for a break from this public discourse but it is super interesting to have a pop culture moment like this that kind of you know has everyone talking it's hard to get that in this day and age where where our attentions are so fractured and spread across so many different niches and platforms this really did seem to kind of grip everyone and i love an enduring pop culture moment i do the next one should be the dissolution of the monarchy all right, so that is it for this video. It was extremely long. I'm so sorry. I will be coming out with something a little bit more fun and lighthearted at the end of this week. I do my premieres on Sunday. You can follow me on TikTok. I've been having a lot of fun there. Very different content to what I've been doing today. And I'll leave my Twitter, Instagram, everything linked down below. And I will see you in the next one. So subscribe if you liked this one.